When it comes to hormones and osteoporosis, some of the studies from a little over 20 years ago did a remarkable job of showing the potential improvement of fracture risk with hormone replacement therapy. The Women's Health Initiative with combined therapy showed a 24 to 33% reduction and the estrogen only arm showed up to a 40% reduction in fractures. Now often the takeaway from the Women's Health Initiative is that combined hormone replacement therapy with this thing called medroxyprogesterone acetate or MPA or progestin is good for bones and it is. However, you can see that by looking at these two studies that the combined versus the estrogen only had a difference. And the combined therapy did not perform as well as estrogen only. So in this video, I wanna discuss progestins. I wanna discuss these synthetic progesterones and their role in bone health. So stick around if you are a woman or if you know a woman that may be exposed to birth control or hormone replacement in her lifetime because there's a lot of dangerous misconceptions here and I wanna clear this up. So stick around. Okay, so these two studies from the Women's Health Initiative that were published in the early 2000s were both monumental and destructive. The downside of these publications is that in an effort, arguably you don't really know what the intent was, but in an effort to show that they did not have cardiovascular prevention, talking about hormones here, there was the misconception that estrogen was responsible for an increased risk of invasive breast cancer, blood clots, potentially other hazards like stroke. And the impact was that hormones were removed from millions of women's medications and treatment plans out of this fear that came out of these studies. I just want to talk a little bit about the difference between how we manage patients with hormones and what was in these studies and why we need to look at the studies in a different way. And I have this discussion all the time now because there's so many questions about, about hormones and safety. And so let me just clear up a couple of things here. The Women's Health Initiative, which I'm talking about, it was a, a massive trial and it was actually a really good trial. So it was well designed. It was well run. You can argue about intent and bias, but ultimately we're looking at objectively what they were collecting and what the outcomes were. And there's some really great outcomes to review here. One of my arguments against the way that this trial was designed is that what they used from a hormone replacement perspective isn't what we use now. And so when we're talking about risk, we can't necessarily say that the risk from the Women's Health Initiative is the same as the risk now, but we do need to understand what we can pull out of that uh, of those data sets because there were so many data to review. It was a massive study. And so what they used, which was popular at the time, it was an oral estrogen, uh, which is synthetic, and it, it came from the production out of uh, horses or mares' urines. It's called Premarin. And Premarin is a synthetic estrogen that's oral, which has its own implications, um, and is not identical to the estradiol or estriol or whatever you're using in a, in a bioidentical hormone. Um, but that's what they used in that study. And that was used in both the estrogen-only arm as well as the combined arm. In the combined arm, they also used MPA, or medroxyprogesterone acetate, and the brand name of that is Provera. So you had Premarin and Provera, which was very popular at the time, um, and then you had a, a Premarin-only group. So you had these two different arms of, of women who were on hormones. The estrogen-only group were for only women that had also had a hysterectomy. So they didn't need the protection of the progestin of the endometrial lining or the lining of the uterus. Um, that's a whole other conversation about why that's probably short-sighted, but that's the way that it was set up. So now we can look at this study to say, okay, well, an oral estrogen had this impact on this group, and an oral estrogen plus Provera, which was this synthetic progestin, uh, not progesterone, but a synthetic progestin had this impact on this group of women. And what we found, and this is sort of what all the uproar was about, was that in the combined arm, which was stopped early, there was an increased risk of invasive breast cancer. Some concerns about some other things too, blood clot, stroke, et cetera, but they stopped it because of the increased risk of invasive breast cancer. Now the estrogen only group continued on because that risk was not there. In fact, nearly statistically significant was a protection from invasive breast cancer. And so most people took away from the WHI, and I was in, in medical school at the time, so most people took away that estrogen causes breast cancer. I and mean, that's what I was taught. 
Right? It was just, just the clear answer. Now, I didn't read this study back then, and I probably should have, but I just said, wow, man, estrogen is scary. Let's not use estrogen. But when I go back and look at these data now, what it clearly shows is that progestin and estrogen caused this. Estrogen alone caused this. The difference between the two groups was the progestin. Yet the progestin was not really blamed for the negative outcome of the, the combined group. At the time, you could kind of argue maybe that it was both, maybe you just needed more studies, but more studies have been done and the progestins continue to be the um, continue to be the problem child. So when you look at studies on progestins and postmenopausal women, you continue to see the signal, increased risk of breast cancer, increased risk of blood clot, increased risk of stroke and heart attack. Progestins are scary little molecules. And what's really scary is that progestins are used not only for combined hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal women, but also in oral contraceptive pills and other contraceptives in young women. So now, you know, decades later, because these things have been out for, for decades, we have pretty clear evidence that these things are not good for people, they're not good for women, and there are a lot of potential implications and some clear increased risks. What I wanna point out today is that when you are choosing with your doctor what kind of hormone replacement to be on, be clear what kind of progesterone you're on. Is this a progestin? Is this a synthetic progesterone? And if so, there are associated risks with that, which I wanna go over, or is it an oral progesterone? And we'll talk about the difference there. I also wanna talk about what we know now about bone health and progestins in young women. And this is an area that I have a lot of interest in because young women, I think, are being skipped over in this conversation about bone health. And yet we know, clearly, as I'm gonna show, that there are risks with some of the things that we're exposing these young women to. So I'm gonna continue on and talk about the risk of progestins for both postmenopausal women, perimenopausal women, and premenopausal women, um, and how we don't necessarily need to expose ourselves to these risks because there are other options. Okay, so birth control, if you're taking it as an oral combined or progesterone, progestin rather, only form carries with it, as we know now, some of the same risks as MPA in postmenopausal women. Increased risk of blood clot, possibly increased risk of breast cancer, and other risks which include increases in blood pressure, stroke, other cancers, liver disease, known nutrient deficiencies, B12, folate, zinc, mood changes, and bone loss. Actually, an increased risk of fracture. All right, so when you look at this study from 2022, it's titled The Effect of Oral Contraceptives on Bone Mineral Density. So clearly what they're looking at is what's happening with birth control in our young women in regards to bone mineral density. And again, this is a, a perspective that I think is so often overlooked because we're just not thinking about bone mineral density in young women, which if you've been following this channel, you know that we need to. We know that peak bone mineral density occurs in your early 20s to 30s, and the decline is relatively steady from there. And so we need to be cognizant of the things that we're exposing ourselves to in our 20s and 30s, especially as women, especially if there are other negatives. We do not need to necessarily be on these drugs, at least the vast majority of people don't need to be on these drugs. They start by saying when it comes to premenopausal and perimenopausal women that combined oral contraceptives, so that's progesterone and estrogens, have no impact on bone mineral density in women that have no estrogen deficiency. And that's probably true because the estrogen is gonna have the biggest role here. But then they go on to say that progestins, so progestin only pills, may not affect bone mineral density, but further research is needed. And the reason why they say that is that some of the studies show that it does and some of the studies show that it doesn't. They then go on to say that the, the depot version or the subcutaneous version that's, in, that's uh, injected, and this is MPA, so the same thing that's in the Women's Health Initiative, does have a negative impact, especially in adolescence. The impact is related to the duration Fortunately, when you remove it, sometimes that impact can go away, but that there is an impact of progestin only. And then they go on to say that the intrauterine devices should not have an impact because it's not really absorbed systemically. So those are local phenomenon. But the thing that I struggle with here is that we know that MPA potentially can have an impact. There are other ways to prevent pregnancy. I know that's not the only reason why they're used, but there are other ways to do this and there are other ways to optimize hormones. It just takes more work. 
And so I think that oral contraceptive pills are so overutilized with young women because it is the answer to basically every problem, it seems like, that is potentially mood, issues around a period, not having a consistent period. So all of these different things that are around menstruation, basically the answer is the same, go on birth control. It might take some work up, but there are other ways to resolve that. And that's something that we do, we do quite often. So our experience with hormone replacement is that if a woman comes in, and we do work with premenopausal women. If a woman comes in and is on birth control, the question is always why? Is this something that could be potentially treated in a different way? Um, I can think of one patient that has come in that started on birth control and we haven't been able to get her off of birth control and back onto another way to fix the problem of what she was on birth control for. It is generally possible. They are not required drugs. And for the most part, they are just covering up the issue and you need to get down to the root cause of the issue. So. If anybody listening to this has a daughter or is on oral contraceptives, I would encourage you to work with your team to talk about alternatives and figuring out why you need them in the first place. And remember that an oral contraceptive pill is not adequate hormone replacement, in my opinion. What does this have to do with osteoporosis? Well, before we get there, let me just mention that if you haven't already, please take a second, just click that subscribe button for me. That's the best thing you can do to help support this channel and to get this information out to as many people as we can who have questions about bone health. Also, if you haven't signed up for our masterclass and done that yet, it is a totally free opportunity uh, for you to hear me talk about all of the approaches that we use for osteoporosis and bone health, tips and tricks you can do on your own, um, and then also a little bit about how we do it. Uh, another way to do that, or in addition to that, is to download our free ebook. So you can download the ebook totally free. The links for all these things are in the description below. Um, you can buy it off of Amazon, and if you could just leave me a review, um, that's all I ask you to do for that, and I really appreciate the support of that book, which is really helping to get a lot of people the information that they need around uh, osteoporosis and how to just figure out uh, a direction forward. Okay, so how does this relate to bone health? Well, I wanted to compare oral contraceptives, progestin use, the potential bone risk there for younger women, but also to talk about uh, progestin use in postmenopausal women and how there are potentially better choices. And so I did pull a study, uh, it's actually from 2004, so this was shortly after the Women's Health Initiative was published, and this is called Fracture Incidents in Relation to the Pattern of Use of Hormone Therapy in Postmenopausal Women. So this was a, a big study, 140,000 women, um, and they were followed prospectively, and they looked at women that had falls. So there were 3.7% of them, or a little over 5,000 women that reported uh, a fracture, and uh, almost 80% of these were from falls. So what they noticed within this study is that the people who were current users of hormone therapy at baseline had a significantly reduced incidence of fracture. And these are mostly combined uh, hormone therapies. So this is mostly women that are on both estrogen and a progestin. If women started hormone therapy, the protection that, that was imparted by the hormone therapy was pretty quick. Uh, so it, it came on within months of starting the therapy, which is really interesting because we know that it takes years in order to improve bone mineral density, especially from hormones alone. It's, it's much slower than some of the other modalities. And so to see that the benefit increased really, really, really quickly shows that there are other reasons why bones respond favorably to hormones than is just the bone mineral density. So then the study goes on to talk about the potential differences between different types of estrogen only, estrogen plus progestin, different types of hormones, or even dosages of hormones. Now this is where I think gathering this data could be challenging because a lot of women don't know uh, what they're on and they probably don't know the dosage. So there is some evidence to say that a certain blood level of estrogen will have a, a specific impact on bone health. So I, I don't think we can safely say that the dose doesn't matter, but through this study, they, they couldn't pick that up. What I think is more important here is just that they were able to identify that there was no difference between estrogen only and estrogen plus progestin. And that's really what I want to get through here is that yes, progestins are potentially devious molecules, but as long as they are combined with estrogen in a postmenopausal woman, the risk of fracture is probably not going to be changed. The other thing that, that this study points out, which I think is really important in a question I get all the time, is that when somebody was on hormones and they came off of hormones, the incident rates of fracture returned to the pre-hormone status or if they didn't have hormones or similar to those without hormones within a year of ceasing use. So remembering that hormone replacement only works when you're on it, because similar to exercise, I get the same questions, which is 
how long do I have to work out like this? How long do I have to be on these hormones? How long do I have to be on these supplements? Remember that we are trying to elevate you from where our social system, our medical system, our, our toxic environment would leave you, would spit you out, which is sick, deficient, depleted. We're trying to elevate you to that next level of health. Hormones only work when you're on them. Supplements only work when you take them. Exercise only works if you continue it. This is a lifestyle. This is a decision that you are going to fight aging. You're going to fight a limited lifespan and health span with the tools that you have access to. So hormone replacement only works when you're on it. It's only going to decrease your risk when you are on it. And as soon as you come off of it, it's going to go back to where you were uh, within months. So here's the question then about progestin. So if you are going down a traditional pathway, you are likely on either an estradiol patch, which would be my preference in the traditional medical model. Um, we use creams, but a patch could give you adequate estrogen if it's in a high enough dose. And then some kind of a progestin uh, if you have a uterus. Uh, and a lot of times you're not on a progestin at all if you don't have a uterus because there's no uh, endometrial lining to protect. There are other reasons, though, that your body may benefit from progesterone. One of those is your bones. I'll talk about that another day. But remember this. Progestins, we know from the Women's Health Initiative and multiple other studies, progestins increase your risk of invasive breast cancer. They increase your risk of blood clot. They increase your risk of stroke. So for me, for my patients, I would rather than be on a topical estradiol, whether that's a patch or a cream, an oral progesterone, the natural version, and a topical testosterone, which nobody ever talks about in the traditional medical model. Nothing is without risk. Yes, there are risks. And yes, that is a one-on-one -on -one independent conversation you have to have with the team that's prescribing you hormones. But for me, this is the safest combo. When done right, tested correctly, monitored closely through the lens of health span, I think we're really limiting the potential risk. We have to understand that, of course, there's risk. People, women and men, develop breast cancer. People develop other cancers. Uh, people develop heart disease. People have strokes. You know, we cannot hide from these things because they're going to happen. The question is, is are they going to happen because of the intervention that we're on or are they going to happen despite the intervention that we're on? And so that's a, a challenging question and it takes, I think, the right provider to be able to look past the fear around hormones and to get to that final answer of what's right for your bone health. So big picture here is if you're on a if you have access to and you are on combined hormone replacement therapy, you're going to get similar protection of your bones. Just be wary of the other risks. I wanted to put this video out here because I have made pretty strong statements about progestins in the past, and I would rather see my patient on an estradiol and a progestin rather than nothing because you're going to get that same protection of your bones but of course with the other risks that I just mentioned. So progestins, I would prefer for people to not be on them, but I would rather they be on a combined hormone replacement therapy than on nothing if they're candidates for that. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I also hope that the point about younger women on oral contraceptives also makes sense and that um, this stimulates some conversation around that from a safety perspective. And that's all I have for this video. Um, if you have more questions, you want to be a part of a supportive network, I would st strongly encourage you to check out our HealthSpan Nation. This is where we combine our, our bone health group and our health optimization group. We put all of our resources uh, in one place, the discount codes for all the things that we're doing, uh, for all the, the materials and uh, products that we vet are going to be in the HealthSpan Nation and a weekly Q&A. Uh, with myself and other team members or experts in the spaces that we're interested in um, to uh, provide you guys with the opportunity to answer uh, and ask questions uh, and also a, a group um, area that you could pr to potentially participate in to ask similar like-minded people um, uh, questions as well. So uh, if you want to check out more about that, you can go to drdouglucas.com and um, we'll have all of our resources for all of our things on drdouglucas.com and uh, I'll see you in the next video.